before him fall the King of kings. Oh, come adore our God who reigns forevermore. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave. Lord of all, let every throne before him fall, the King of kings, oh come adore. Jeff's awake. That's good. We are happy to have you here with us today at Kilpatrick Church. Uh, if you have a bulletin and were able to get one on the way in, there is a lot of announcements in there. It is a busy week with Kilpatrick. Uh, welcome to Palm Sunday. We are happy to have you here. So getting into this week of Palm Sunday and Easter, uh, if we go in order by date, just because I'm type A and I have to do by date in order, we have our first thing coming up is the KC Women's Event here at Kilpatrick, and that is on Thursday, April 14, from 6.30 to 8, and that is open to any and all women. You can invite any of your friends, too, that would like to come out and join uh, for a fantastic night of worship and discussion and uh, many other things that I don't know because I'm not a woman. Next, we have two events on Friday, Good Friday. We have our KC Moms event back this month, and that is here at Kilpatrick, 9 to 11, and that is, again, open to all uh, women and moms for, uh, there's child care provided, but a chance for moms to have a good breakfast, talk about God, worship together, uh, and just connect. Very, uh, speaking just from my wife's experience with it, it is an incredible experience, and she looks forward to it every month. 
Then we have Good Friday service. We are connecting and meeting up with Sunfield United Brethren Church, and we are at Sunfield United Brethren Church this year. So that is at 7 o'clock on Friday for the Good Friday service. And then we have Saturday, the Easter extravaganza at Manna's Market. It is a food drive, and it is also our Easter egg hunt. Over 6,500 eggs and giveaways. If you did pick up some eggs and you can drop them off at the tubs in the back out in the uh, Narthex area, if you forgot to bring them, just try to get them to the office here at some point this week so we can get them divvied up and ready to be picked up in a matter of seconds. So we have a lot going on, and then we conclude with next week Sunday, Easter Sunday at Kilpatrick, regular times and services. If you are new or visiting or you have prayer requests, please check out the tear-off here, whether your information changed or you have prayer requests that you would like to share with either staff or the whole church. You can fill this out and turn it into, in the back of each doors, we have the wooden buckets, and that is for prayer requests or those information slips, but also tithing. If you need a spot to drop off the tithe, we have the buckets in the back. Uh, I haven't talked about that in a bit, and I needed to remind and get that out there. But a lot of good information in here. Check it out. If you have any questions, you can contact anybody that is at the Welcome Center, and they'd be more than willing to help you out with that. So join me in prayer, and then we'll enter into worship. Heavenly Father, we can be confident and the fact that you will always be there for us. You are the true king. You've reigned at the beginning. You're reigning now. And you will reign forevermore. Those words have such power. They can bring peace. They can eliminate worries that we might have. The fact that you've been in control and will continue to be is such an incredible gift. As we celebrate this Palm Sunday, we remember you coming into the town, being celebrated. And then just a couple days later, being put on trial, sinless, blameless, innocent, but this whole plan was set into place so long ago to die on the cross for our sins, to take away something that we can't do, no one could do, only you. To have a Father that loves us that much, we should praise you every moment we can. You are an incredible Father. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Please stand up and join us for worship.
you gave your life so that we might have life and be raised from spiritual death to life. We owe you everything, Father. 
<clears throat> we ask that you would take our lives, shape them and mold them more and more into the image of Christ. It's because of him that we can stand before your, your throne this morning, giving you honor and praise. Father, we want to praise you that as your word says, you are a God who is near. When we walk through the, the joys of life, you are near. When we travel through the valley, the hard spots, you're there. In moments of temptation, you are near. In moments of indecision where we don't know the next step, you are near us and you guide us. I praise you for being a God who is near. God, thank you for loving us. Broken people, people scarred and wounded by sin. Yet you loved us so much that you made it possible for us to be adopted into your family and to become your child. Thank you. Thank you for that love that the scripture says is unfailing. Lord, we've gathered here this morning, coming from a busy week, <clears throat> no doubt things on our mind. Would you push aside all the distractions from us this morning and help us to focus our attention fully on you today? You know the needs that are represented here and by our congregation, and I pray, God, God of all power, that you would bring the healing touch where it's needed, that you would supply every need, that you would receive honor and glory from whatever you do. We are looking to you for help and strength in this service this morning. Open our hearts to hear your word. Would you grant me the ability to share your truth accurately? Holy Spirit, we just invite you to to work in this place today. Thank you, Jesus, for the love that you have for us, giving your life. We love you. We pray this in your powerful name. Amen. You may be seated. I mentioned last Sunday that if you are interested in baptisms, we plan to do baptism service next Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning. If you are interested in that, want to talk to me about that, immediately following the service, I'll be out here, out these double doors in the, in the lobby area. Come talk to me. And um, if you want to be baptized, we'll see that that gets done next Sunday morning. Well, we're not in Philippians this week. You didn't cheer Neither did the first service, so maybe we should have gone back to Philippians. Now, this morning, I, I want to invite you to take a journey with me. I know that we can't hop on a plane this morning and, and head to Israel, but uh, I want us to travel to Israel this morning in, in our minds. I want us to go back some almost 2,000 years ago. We're going to spend some time in the northern region and move into Jerusalem. The story that we want to look at from Scripture is one that everyone is familiar with. In fact, you know the story and the events of the triumphal entry as well as I do. And so I'm under no illusion this morning that I'll be able to give some fresh insight, you know, some, something novel. But maybe God would help us as we walk through this familiar event in the life of our Savior, this incredibly important event. And maybe God will help us to just see something that will benefit us. My hope is that at the end of the message this morning, we will each be able to answer this question, is Jesus your king? Is Jesus your king? 
all four of the Gospels give the account of the events of the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. I would like to read Matthew and Luke's recording of those events this morning. So if you have your Bibles, uh, we will look at Matthew chapter 21, the first 11 verses, and then we're going to flip over to Luke chapter 19, and we will begin looking at verse 28 of Luke 19. First, Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse 1. Matthew says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. In Galilee. Now turn with me to Luke chapter 19. And again, Luke is recounting the events of that day. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. There's a little extra detail that Luke brings in there. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he was going along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day that what would bring peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That's how Matthew recorded the events, or Luke recorded the events of that day. I I found it interesting that Luke added that detail that you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Just a a quick rabbit trail. Can you think of anything that would be more of a recipe for disaster than an unbroken donkey in the midst of a crowd shouting, waving palm branches? And yet, who was riding on that donkey? The creator, right? The one who has power over nature. I think it's interesting that we find those, just those little pieces of evidence telling us of who Jesus is. 
I will tell you this morning, we're going to look at some maps. I don't want to bore you to death, but I think it's good to understand the lay of the land. We're going to begin this morning in northern Israel, around the Sea of Galilee, perhaps around Capernaum. Uh, remember, Capernaum was the hometown of Jesus' ministry. It's where it was his home base. All around this, the Sea of Galilee, this region is called the Galilee. You find places like uh, Magdala, Mary, of Mag Mary Magdalene, she was from Magdala, Tiberias, Bethsaida, Chorazin, all of these were towns in the vicinity of the Sea of Galilee. Our journey is going to begin there, and, and we will end up then in Jerusalem. Uh, you see, the, the nation of Israel in that day was divided in three basic sections. The northern portion was Galilee, and then the center section is Samaria, and then we have the lower section of Judea. Well, let me talk about the, the center section, the Samaria region of Samaria. Who were the Samaritans? What was this region all about? Well, there was a time when the king of Syria had exiled many of the Jews. He brought in people who were non-Jews, settled them into this region of Samaria. The Jews then intermarried with these non-Jews, and so uh, they became the Samaritans, and they had kind of a mixture of pagan religion as well as Judaism. But there was no love lost between the Jews and the Samaritans. In fact, often as people, the Jews, would travel from Galilee to Jerusalem, they would come down to, if you look where it starts, um, uh, let's come down to maybe uh, Salem, somewhere along in there, they would cross over to the east side of the Jordan to bypass. They wouldn't go through Samaria. They would get down to Jericho, come back across the, the, the Jordan River, and then go up. They would go out of their way to not go into Samaria. But we're going to follow Luke's path as he shares Jesus' journey to, for the last time into Jerusalem. And if we go to Luke chapter 17, we read these words. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. I'm going to put a yellow line up there. Well, try again. There's a yellow line there kind of running from Caesarea over to just above Salem. Jesus is somewhere along that border between the Galilee and Samaria. And the scripture tells us that he runs into, at some village, 10 lepers. Jesus heals all 10 lepers, tells them to go to show themselves to the priest. Now, how many of those came back and said, thank you? One. This is part of Jesus' journey. This is something that took place on his journey as he was making his way into Jerusalem to ultimately give his life. We discover that... Um, this journey, I want to show you kind of where we're headed in the first part of the journey. You see a red line tracing from around the Sea of Galilee, heading south. I don't know why it's moving so much, but um, just bear with me this morning. This is a several-day journey. The ultimate journey from the Sea of Galilee area to Jerusalem is about 80 miles the longest part of this journey would be from the Sea of Galilee down to Jericho. Very rugged terrain. The further they move south, the, the more rugged it gets. We're going to be moving towards the city of Jericho this morning as we travel this journey with Jesus. After he healed the, the ten they start moving closer and closer to Jericho. And somewhere along the way, the scripture doesn't tell us where, parents begin to bring little children to Jesus so that he would bless them. His disciples begin pushing them back, saying, no, leave him alone, don't bother him. And Jesus rebuked them and said, let the little children come to me. 
somewhere before they get to Jericho, Jesus has a very um, sober conversation with his 12. If your Bibles are open, look with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 31. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. Verse 34, the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them and they did not know what he was talking about. This wasn't the first time he had had this conversation with them, but they didn't comprehend it. Travel with me to the outskirts of Jericho. Luke chapter 19 gives, or excuse me, Luke chapter 18, verse 35, gives us some information. Let me just read a portion of it. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. There was something that caught my attention when I was reading this in my study time. When the blind man heard the crowd, and so the question was, why was there a crowd with Jesus? And then I remembered. It was near Passover time. And Passover was one of the three major feasts of Judaism where at least once in your lifetime, you made your way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. In my mind, I think as I've grown up reading this story, I just had it in my head that it was Jesus and the 12 disciples making their way. No, there were many others from the region of the Galilee headed in up to Jerusalem ultimately to celebrate the Passover. So there's a large crowd with Jesus as he's approaching the city of Jericho. They're on the northern end. They're coming from the south. So if you look at this picture that's up on the screen, and if you look to my left, your right, that would be the north in this picture. So Jesus and his followers, as well as the crowd, would be coming in from the north, coming into the city of Jericho. What do we know about Jericho? Jericho is the lowest city on earth. It's some 845 feet below sea level. It's, the best they can tell, the oldest walled city in existence, some guesstimates around 9,000 years old. They have found the ruins of the old city. In the Old Testament, it was called the City of Palms. It was in the desert, but there was water supply there. It was oasis-like. We're probably most familiar with the story of, of Joshua and the children of Israel as they crossed over the Jordan River, and that was the first city. They, they walked around the city once a day for seven days and then seven times and the walls of Jericho come tumbling down, right? This is the city that we're talking about. Jesus is making his way into the city now. And as he goes into the city, we discover this, well, the scripture says that he was a tax collector. The scripture tells us that he was short. His name is? Zacchaeus, did you do the song that Zacchaeus was, a wee little man, a wee little man was he? Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was a Jew who had 
kind of betrayed his people, and he was working for the Roman government collecting taxes. He was not a well-liked man. He had got, gotten rich over collecting exorbitant taxes. But he heard Jesus was coming through, and, and he wanted to see Jesus, but he was so short that he couldn't see because of the crowd. So Zacchaeus runs ahead and climbs up into what? A sycamore tree. This is the tree. Well, it is a sycamore tree in Jericho. And we took this picture when, when we were there. And, and Zacchaeus climbs up in this tree. And, and it's pretty amazing if you look close. Some interesting things happen. And uh, so he, he's there up in the tree. Do you see him? Okay. It's amazing what happens when you're in Israel. You're dead this morning. Come on, folks. Yeah, there was a fence around it, couldn't, right? But can you imagine Zacchaeus' humiliation and embarrassment when this one he wanted to see stops underneath the tree and says, um, hey, Zach, come on down. I, I want to invite myself to your house for a meal. Zacchaeus comes down. Jesus goes to his house. Zacchaeus places his faith in Jesus. Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Zacchaeus pledges to give back four times whatever he has given or taken from the people. After this meal, there's a continuation of the journey from Jericho on up to Jerusalem. Let me just have you look at some more topography. In this map, we're going to begin in Jericho, and we're going to make our journey up from 845 feet below sea level to some 2,500 feet above sea level in Jerusalem. The pathway that, there, that that is um, following is what is called the Wadi Kelt. We're in the desert. Let me give you... Um, just some more visual. We have took these photos when we were there a few weeks ago. I've placed some arrows in the, we're standing high, looking out across the desert, and you can see there's trees and there's a valley there, the wadi. What is a wadi? A wadi is a place in the desert that's normally dry, but when it rains, the water floods down through there, and then plants grow, and there remains sometimes a little water. It's a place where possibly you will find water uh, to help you along your journey. Another view of Wadi Kelt, and if you look closely, there is a monastery here called St. George's Monastery. But I, I want you not to focus on that, but I want you to just see the ruggedness. This is the pathway. You remember the, the parable or the story of the Good Samaritan. This happened along this Wadi Kelt, this 17-mile journey from Jericho on up to Jerusalem. Uh, now, let me give you, there's a brief 23-second video. There's, there's sound to it, but it's no teaching. I just want you to observe. This is the very bottom of Wadi Kelt. We're, we're down just a little further, and uh, just I, I want you to just see this. Here in Wadi Kelt. It had rained not long before we had arrived, a few days ahead of that, and so there was water Over at this point. Easier to but a rugged terrain. And Jesus and his disciples are, are making their way from Jericho on up to Jerusalem. Probably a hard one-day walk, but most likely a difficult two-day walk from Jericho up. As Jesus and the crowd and his disciples near Jerusalem, they come to the Mount of Olives. There's a little city, a little village called Bethany, and then another one a little bit closer to Jerusalem on top of Mount of Olives called Beth, or Bethphage. Jesus sent, as we read, two of his disciples into Bethphage and said, you'll find a, a young donkey colt there. Bring him to me. They bring him the donkey. They place their 
outer cloaks over the donkey. Jesus gets on the donkey and begins the journey over Mount of Olives and begins making his way down. As he did so, the crowds begin to, to shout and wave palm branches, saying things like, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. The crowds were excited and cheering. But the scripture records that there were some Pharisees in the crowd. Jesus seemed to always have a run in with these guys. And they heard the crowd saying things that were messianic in nature, son of David. See, the Messiah would be a descendant of David. They hear the crowd saying things like, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They understood the language. This guy is letting the people proclaim him as Messiah. They go to Jesus and say, listen, tell your people to hush. And Jesus says, listen, if they're quiet, the rocks will cry out. I'm not going to tell them to stop. Jesus continues a little ways down the Mount of Olives, and there's a place that we visited when we were there, Dominus Flevit. It's the place where Jesus wept over Jerusalem. We read that from the Gospel of Luke. Why was Jesus weeping? Two reasons that I can see. Number one, they missed him. The majority of people missed that he was the Messiah, that God had visited them. But I believe he was also weeping because he knew that in coming days, back in 70 AD, the city of Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. And he weeps as he comes down the mountain. He continues on to the, through the bottom of the Kidron Valley on up into Jerusalem, and, and the scripture says that the whole city was stirred. Who is this? And probably some who had traveled with him from the Galilee said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. You say, well, why would the city be stirred? Well, the city was under the control. All of Israel was under the control of the Romans. And they have a king, they have a Caesar. And now here is somebody riding into town on a donkey. And the crowds are saying, this is a king. This could be the Messiah. Can you see why that might stir up the crowd or the town? Put them on edge. This journey was a journey of I think I mentioned about 80 miles. And Jesus now makes this journey to Jerusalem for the last time before he dies. That's the story that we're all familiar with, the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. But let me just share a few observations that come to mind as I think about this event. It seems kind of unusual for a king to ride into town on a donkey, doesn't it? I mean, wouldn't it be more fitting for a king to ride into town on a prancing white stallion or, or maybe come in with some royal carriage and make his appearance known? But the reality is that it was not unusual for a king to ride into town on a donkey. And what they tell us is this, that when a king came into town on a donkey, it meant I'm coming in peace, not coming to cause war. But I think that the people who were praising and cheering Jesus that day had something different in mind. I believe that they were looking back, as Matthew records, to a prophecy given by Zechariah in Zechariah 9.9. Jerusalem your king is coming into town riding on a donkey. Why do we think that that's what their mindset was? Well, they were using messianic titles. Hosanna to the son of David. Remember, the Messiah would be a descendant of David. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. These are messianic words. 
hearts. The people had in mind, maybe this was the Messiah. See, the Jewish people for for centuries had had been anticipating that the Messiah would come, this deliverer who would free them from bondage, free them from whoever was ruling over them. And now, maybe in these people's minds, it's happening. Because the prophet says that the Messiah was going to come in, your king's going to come in on a donkey. Look, this guy's riding in on a donkey. Maybe this is him. And wouldn't that bring extra passion to to yell out even louder, Hosanna to the son of David and blessed is the king who comes. Maybe this is the one, the, the beginning of the end for the Romans is happening. This guy's coming in. Maybe that's why they were so excited. Here's the sad part. They were very accurate in their words but the majority of them missed it. Because Jesus wasn't who they thought the Messiah would be. They were looking for that political deliverer. That's not who Jesus was. They missed him. And thinking about the events of that day, I had to ask myself this question about the majority of the crowd that was there yelling these things, praises to to Jesus. Was he really their king? Had these people really made him their king or were their words just words? Following the emotion of the crowd, kind of the mob mentality. Were their words sincere as they called out Hosanna to the son of David? Blessed is the king who comes. Were were they really genuine in their words? Or was it just the popular thing to do at the moment? Get carried away because maybe this is the Messiah. Then I had to ask this question. Rocky, is Jesus your king? And you put your name there. Is Jesus your king? What do we know about a king? Our governmental system doesn't have a king. But we've all read about kings. We've read the stories in the scripture about kings. We've watched movies that have kings. So we have this concept, maybe we're intrigued by the royalty over in England. We have this concept of royalty of a king. And and these are some of the basic characteristics that we would understand of a king. A king rules or reigns over a region or a group of people, right? That's what a king does. A king has wide-ranging authority over the land, over the people. It's kind of like what he says goes. A king can establish laws of the land and not only establishes them, but you know, a king kind of has uh, life or death in his hands. The king can dispense judgment almost as he wishes, it seems. We know this, that a king is worthy of honor and respect, and generally you think of those who are the subjects of the king as being loyal to him, having allegiance for the king, and serving him. These are thoughts that we have or understandings that we have of what a king does. And you know, the reality is that's who Jesus is. He's king. He rules or reigns over a region or over people, over all of those who have placed their faith in him. He rules over us. He has wide-ranging authority. Everything belongs to him. He has established the laws of the land, and he measures out judgment. One day we're all going to stand before him. And is he worthy of honor and respect? Is he worthy of our allegiance? Should we serve him? See, Jesus fits the bill of a king. 
Because the reality is Jesus is king. He is king. I ask you this question, is he your king? Is he your king? Because the truth of the matter is Jesus is king whether you make him king of your life or not. And he's not going to force you today to be his servant, to be his subject. But there is coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He gives us that option today to make him king. But he is king whether you make him king or not. Never forget that. Maybe you ask, how do do you make Jesus king of your life? How do you make him king? Well, certainly you don't make him king simply by standing in the crowd cheering Hosanna to the son of David. Just just making a statement because a whole crowd is doing it doesn't make him king of your life. How do you make him king of your life? Well, you humble yourself before him. You come before him recognizing him as king. Confessing your sins. Letting him know that I have violated your laws. You are the king. You have every right to to make the rules, if you will. But I have violated them, and I'm sorry. I turn from them. And then place your faith in his work on the cross for you. He gave his life, gave his blood. The scripture says his blood cleanses us from all sin. You humble yourself. You confess. Place your faith in We discover that when we do that, he will forgive us. And we become his. He becomes our king. Making Jesus king is a choice. It's a choice that every one of us have to make personally. My parents can't make it for me. You can't make it for your children. But then you say, but once he is king, then what? He is looking for us to humbly and willingly walk in obedience following his plan. He doesn't force this. But what he's saying is, if if I'm your king, you will walk in obedience to me. You will live my way. And, And did you know that he has the authority to tell you how to live and to tell me how to live. He's God. He's creator. He knows what is best for you. He knows. And he has the right, he has the authority because he's king to tell me and you how to live. And our commitment then is to walk continually his way. How do you make him king? Humble yourself, confess, place your faith, and then live his way. Go back with me to the crowd that day. Many in the crowd were just giving lip service. Oh, there were true followers of Christ. There were those in the crowd who had truly made him king, but the majority probably were not committed to him. You say, why do you say that? Well, we know that a few days after this event, Jesus is crucified and buried, and he rises again after three days. He ascends into heaven about 10 days later, and then, or no, 40 days later, and then 10 more days, there's how many people in the upper room in Jerusalem? 120. Now, I'm not here this morning saying that there were only 120 believers who had made Jesus king, but there certainly wasn't a large crowd that had welcomed him into Jerusalem. The number was small. The majority that day were simply giving lip service, but he wasn't their king. So I ask this straightforward but gently. Are you just one in the crowd that it's easy or popular on Sunday, I come and I sing and I know what to say and I, I live 
I do Christian things. I make profession that I'm a believer, I'm, that Jesus is my king. But the reality is that you've never made him king. It's just lip service. Are you just one in the crowd? That's a serious question. Because you see, Jesus is king. And he wants to be king of your life. Is he? That's the question. Is he king of your life? Would you bow your heads for just a moment this morning? I don't know who God may have been talking to through this service today, but maybe there are those who would say, you know, I've never made him king. I... I know the right things to do. I I can go through the motions, but I've never made him king. I've never confessed my sins. I've I've never turned my life over him. I've never come under his authority, but I want to do that. I'm going to pray a a simple prayer, and, and this isn't just a say the prayer and everything's good, but God hasn't made it difficult. If we want place his son Jesus as king. We sincerely confess our sins, admitting that we're sinners. We ask him to forgive us. We place our faith in what Jesus has done, and he has promised to forgive us and and bring us into his family, and Jesus will become our king. I'm going to pray, and right where you are, you can sincerely talk to God, and you can use the words that I'm using or whatever works best in your language, your words. God, this morning I confess to you that you are not my, that Jesus is not my king. I confess that I am a sinner, that I'm lost, that I've violated your laws. You have authority to tell me how to live, but I have disregarded it, and I'm sorry. I confess my sins to you today, asking that based upon what Jesus did for me, that the blood of Christ would cleanse me of my sins, that you would adopt me into your family. Jesus, I place you as king of my life. And my commitment with your help is that for the rest of my life, I will follow you. Jesus, you will be my king. Now, Father, maybe there are those this morning who, right where they are, just talk to you and confess their sins. You've promised to forgive. And I pray if there was anyone like that this morning, that you would grant them strength and determination that they will begin this, not only begin this journey, but they will stick with this journey from now till the moment of their death. Jesus, you're our king. We gladly claim you as our king. May we live that way. Father, as we leave this facility this morning. We go with confidence in you, grateful for Jesus, our King, and we pray this in his powerful name. Amen. This morning, I'm, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to step out into this, the lobby area. If you're interested in baptism, um, please come see me. But I would also, if anybody prayed this morning as we were praying I'd love to know that and rejoice with you over making Jesus your king. Look forward to seeing you next Sunday, Easter Sunday morning, as we celebrate our risen Savior. Go live out your faith. You are dismissed.